Professor Spooner, how are you today? Good morning, Frank. I'm well, thank you, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, uh, not the. It's we're back to real time, and uh, which made me think of uh, uh, really real time. And uh, it occurred to me that um, uh, globalization has not affected the way we think about time yet, uh, and the way we think we organize time globally um uh, uh in the uh, well um uh, nearly 150 years ago now i think uh was in the colonial period and is very very much um um well i mean why why greenwich mean time and mm. it's true that the um, idea of greenwich mean time and everything being standardized at the greenwich observatory in london uh uh was um what should I say, modified somewhat by the idea of universal time coordinated, UTC, yep. um, which, which in fact um, one hears very little about. One still, uh, um, I mean, I, of course, I listen to the news on the BBC when I'm uh, driving into the museum every day, uh, and that, they talk about GMT all the time. Uh, so I'm, I'm suppose that's not surprising, but. Um, uh, I don't hear about UTC anywhere else. Um, so um, it, it occurs to me, when thinking about this, um, when I when I was uh, uh, making sure that I got up at the right time this morning, uh, that uh, the, um, the, there's really no reason why we can't have one time system for the whole world, which because after all, we should be thinking um, of coordinating everything here in relation to the universe in which we live. Um, and the, uh, time is much more complicated than most people understand because we have, there are things like leap seconds as well as leap years. Mm -hmm. And uh, time is, um, uh, is being, um, what should I say, uh, affected all the time by um, uh, the our orbital geometry, as they say, um, the fact that, um, that our, our rotation around the uh, sun is not um, as completely regular as is generally assumed, and so it seems to me that what what we ought to have in a in the age of globalization is a um, uh, an understanding of time that is um, organized globally by some international body, uh, which gives us the same um, uh, time system everywhere in the world, even though it would be dark at, at, at 12 o'clock in, in uh, midnight in some places and not in others, um, instead of having to get your watch, change your watch wherever you go. Well, that that's... That's pretty ambitious. Um, in, in fact, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, back in the days of the Soviet Union, um, all Soviet uh, military time uh, was uh, equivalent to Moscow time. So uh, if you were out in Vladivostok, uh, the, the clocks on the base uh, reflected the time in Moscow. Um, and of no, course, I, I'd forgotten that, and they've got five time zones. Oh, that, more I think, time that, zones I, think that, I think they may have more than five time zones. Um, really? I think they do. And then, of course, on uh, nuclear submarines, um, the time zone is, uh, the, the time is set to, uh, I mean, they use a 24-hour clock. It, it doesn't change uh, yeah. dependent upon the location of the submarine. Um, well, I, the 24-hour clock have become much more common mm -hmm. uh, but then why 24 hours well that's uh, what I, that's what I want to, that's what I wanted to ask you uh, and uh, I, I I don't know I, let me just there's there's two questions um, the, the first question is a, a more recent question and I'll ask that first but I'd like you to answer the second question first if I could the, the first question is th there is no doubt that the uh, uh, the increasing um, uh, sophistication of marking time is very conducive, uh, certainly to business and to uh, society. I mean, we are able in our small company to schedule meetings uh, that begin 15 minutes after the hour uh, 
uh, with people in uh, the Eastern time zone of the United States and um, in England on the, uh, the, the, the UTC time zone. Um, and it's, it works, it actually does work. You can schedule WebEx meetings and, and have that. Um, but my, 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 my more important question is, from an anthropological perspective, uh, before people's schedules became so compressed where you had to be able to have this certainty of, of time to schedule meetings, say 15 minutes after the hour uh, with five, six or eight people uh, 3,000, 4,000 miles away. I mean, how was it that that the concept of time evolved? I mean, as, as particular tribes began to have contacts with other tribes and would maybe send a messenger saying that we wanted to meet you by this river on the day after the third uh, night after the new moon and people would just go to that river and wait for the whole day for the other tribe to show up i mean it's of uh, humankind how people began to look at time well uh, uh when there was no means of remote communication Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. You could only you could only interact with people face to face. So time um, was really not a significant variable. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um, uh, the, the the people who um, began to um, uh, organize time somewhat analytically for us, uh, sexagesimally. Mm -hmm. instead of decimally though i don't know where 24 and 7 came from except that 7 was a lucky number but i don't but 24 is even um well maybe it was 12 and 12 not 24 and 24 was a a sub i, sub I, don't, I, I don't know i don't know how it derived i don't know i never, never but anyway the, the 60s um began um i don't think i'm not sure we know exactly when they began but they uh, had something to do with the beginning of writing, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen anything actually written about it, or at least I've not read anything uh, that directly uh, uh, focuses on this interesting question. What, what, um, what is the earliest that, that you can remember having read about uh, um, it, it being referred to, other than other than a meeting in a, in a, in a, on a particular day or in, in a uh, evening or an afternoon? I mean, when, when, when did the concept of actual hours or, or time arise? I mean, I guess- Well, I think- The sundial. I think I it, it's, um, I mean, the only thing I have, uh, that I have in my memory about it is, is things that were uh, just simply talking about how we got to 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour mm -hmm. and uh, that it came from um, the earliest records we have of anything um, which would be starting uh, uh, by the end of the fourth millennium by 3000 BCE really um, but just exactly how that's known I don't know um, uh, so um the the, the um, and i also don't know act actually how um decimal counting began mm -hmm. but, but it's interesting now that the, the whole globe counts decimally and uh accepts the idea of 60s in the in time calculation and 24 and 7. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the same way that everybody accepts longitude and latitude. Um, and all these things were, um, they, they came into the Western world from the classical tradition. And then they were um, uh, organized further in the colonial period because of the, the, the needs of, um, uh, of the colonial administration and expanded throughout the world with apparently no problem, nobody really asking any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the, the Chinese did have earlier ways of doing it, which were somewhat different, but I'm afraid I don't know anything about it. And I would, have, I would imagine that the Indians probably did as well, because the Indians, I mean, there's so many 
things came from India that are really important in modern. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the zero, we didn't have a zero before the Indians thought it right. up. Right, right. Um, well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just wondering, really, the 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 whole concept of it um, really is it's it's thrust at uh, an organizational kind of notion, isn't it? As, as to, I mean, if you're if you're even remotely interested in demarking time, I mean, you must be wanting to do it for a reason. And the only couple of reasons I can think of is is a to communicate to other people um, uh, about meeting. Uh, at, at a particular hour or, or time during a day, or uh, recounting in, in, in past, about the past, as to when an event happened during a particular time of the day. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little, now that we're talking about it, I mean, it's one of those things that you always think about, it's so obvious, et cetera, et cetera, but why was it even bothered to be thought of in the first place? I, that that's well, the part it, of... it has to do it has to do with organization that if you um if you, the, the 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 as more and more people start to work together to do things mm -hmm. then you you have to decide what to do when um uh that's the first thing and then the second thing is as you begin to be able to communicate with people remotely then you're organizing uh, meetings over a distance and that requires some notion of time. So um, uh, I think it all has to do with the, um, the, the, the prehistory of the way larger and larger numbers of people came to live together. Mm -hmm. And that uh, began really uh, significantly in the, um, towards the end of the seventh millennium BCE when um, the, the first cities developed okay. as a okay. result of, uh, of the adoption of irrigation to produce much more food. And, and then it to, to come full circle then, hence your original point about in this era of increasing communication and globalization, there's an even more, uh, dare I say, urgent need for a, uh, a standardization of time, perhaps even beyond what we have. All right. Because well, that's that's why I uh, 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 started thinking in this way this morning that it's surprising as um, communication uh, and organization has become much more complex since in the digital age mm -hmm. in the last 20 years or so that we've not done anything about time. Mm -hmm. And after all, one of the things that the French did after their revolution, which which made them think in terms of reorganizing everything, uh, getting rid of the influence of the church, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the, as the state, as, as the monarchy, uh, was to uh, uh, decimalize various things. I can't remember exactly how many things they tried to decimalize at the moment, but I, uh, I don't um, I, I forget now whether they uh, wanted to des uh, um, uh, have ten days in a week. Um, I, th I <laughs> but, think they, uh, I think they did. And if, and if we always, if, if the, going back to uh, 1789, it's always easier to go back to the uh, Khmer Rouge, uh, who picked up a lot of that when they studied in France with the way they tried yeah. to reorganize Cambodian society. Yeah. Um, and, so I mean, I mean, part of the ahead. problem now is is once again organization. We don't have any uh, the the only um, uh, organization we have that is uh, um, supranational is goes beyond the nation state is the organ is the United Nations, which is um, uh, an organization of nation states and is very uh, limited in what it can do and for certainly very limited in what it has done. Mm -hmm. So uh, so what we the, the initial premise that we were just kicking around would be some and and again we're we're not wedded to this necessarily but let's assume we accept it a 24 hour clock globally where uh, right now at uh, 9:20 a.m. in uh, the eastern time zone of the United States and uh, it would we would we would make it. I mean, depending upon 
which time zone we accepted as the primary time zone. Uh, but let's say we were communicating from Greenwich now, and it was 9.20 a.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, so that would mean it would be 4.20 uh, a.m. Uh, in the Eastern time zone of the U.S. And we would, uh, we would be up and about doing whatever we're doing, but it would be 4.20, or it'd be 9.20 a.m. our time everywhere. And people would just have to realize that at 9.20 a.m. they might be sleeping if they're in Singapore, uh, or at 9.20 a.m. they might be at lunch if they're in Moscow, or at 9.20 a.m. in Los Angeles they might be having breakfast. And well, th think, for example, if you were communicating from Mars, mm -hmm. um, should you know um, exactly what time zone you're communicating with, which might be difficult, um, or should you just know roughly what the um, um, the relationship in temporal as well as other terms between Mars and the planet you're communicating with? Hopefully, just the latter. I, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't want to be missing a message from the Martians because we're all asleep. So I guess the uh, the hope would be is that some some somewhere somebody should be awake. Um, so maybe maybe what I'm uh, what what I'm um, looking uh, expecting or thinking ought to happen uh, will be a product of uh, interplanetary communication rather than uh, global communication. Uh, you, you, know, you could be right, because at, at that stage, we would be forced to take a much more holistic view of this uh, small blue planet that we live on. Yeah. And just sort of localize it as Earth time. <laughs> well, that's that's, okay. that's very interesting. I, I wasn't sure where this was going to go, but this, this was actually <laughs> very interesting. So, all right. Well, Brian, thank you okay. very much. And we'll resolve these technical difficulties. And uh, next week, we'll uh, be able to see each other. Okay. Have a good week. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. How are you today? Good morning, Frank. I'm fine, thanks. And I hope you are too. Thank you. Um, this morning, I, uh, well, I think you know that uh, some time ago now, in an introductory essay to a volume on globalization, I wrote that globalization was on the cards from the start um, yes. because I thought that uh, the fact that um, population growth had uh, forced uh, had um, led us to uh, spread throughout the world and we had language um, meant that sooner or later we were all going to be in contact with each other. Uh, but what's always puzzled me is why, in fact, do uh, uh, people always collect together in the largest possible numbers? And that's happened throughout human history. And, and until about 10,000 years ago, the numbers were always very small because of the availability of food, and we were not yet producing our own food. Mm -hmm. But since food has not become a problem, we keep collecting together in larger and larger numbers and now we're going to become a totally urbanized world uh, by, in the, what remains of this century as far as I can see. Anyway, um, somebody I met in an elevator a few years ago uh, <laughs> um, uh, and got talking to about uh, the axial age and the and big history uh, and then became we became quite close friends and have been uh, talking to each other ever since. Had an interesting new idea this week, which he told me about, which I think helps us to understand a lot of things. Um, and that is that um, when we um, uh, left our primate cousins up in the trees in uh, South Central Africa and came down onto the plains and uh, wandered out in away from the trees on the plains we were vulnerable to predators yes. in a way that we had never been before and uh, it was then that we started collecting together in larger and larger numbers in order to uh, for security and that tendency seems to have been part of our evolution because after all we were not uh, we had not evolved entirely into the uh, creatures we uh, 
uh, became in the following millennia. Uh, that was uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think that explains it. Um, however, um, the problem, of course, that we have now is that um, the, uh, we have to organize ourselves and it's the organizer, our organization of ourselves, which is leading to all the problems. So um, the, the, this evolutionary proclivity that uh, appears to have um, um, uh, been launched uh, a few hundred thousand years ago is still driving us to collect together in larger and larger numbers. And now there are really no restrictions on that process. Mm -hmm. But um, because as the numbers get larger, the organizational problems get bigger, um, all the problems we're having in globalization have to do with different forms of organization. And of course, um, uh, when the age, of, well, literacy helped us to develop um, much larger um, uh, forms of, of political organization and economic organization for that matter. Um, but um, uh, and then the age of empire started with uh, 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 literate administrations some 4,000 years ago and lasted really until the middle of the last century when we finally got rid of the European empires. Um, but the, and the empires really did bring things closer together. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the empires was that they divided the world up into administrative districts. And um, when they, uh, uh, they, when they disintegrated and ceased to be empires in the middle of the last century or in the f first uh, since 1900, um, the, the, their administrative districts became what we have come to call nation states um, because of the problems of the relation of the um, uh, interrelation of, of um, spiritual and political authority, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. we've sold uh, in some ways for, uh, for some periods, as with the Pope and the archbishops and so on in the Catholic Church, uh, but uh, n not uh, on a c um, permanent basis, as we can see with the Reformation uh, 500 years ago. Anyway, uh, so now we have this problem of um, uh, th um, um, conflict between, well, the, the, um, since, the, since the end of the Age of Empires, we've had a, a sort of fake empire run by America as a, the world hegemon. Uh. Um, and um, that has um, added to the problems of the um, uh, uh, formation of nation states because um, the, the whole point of the pro of formation of nation states was that um, each state would be independent in terms of religion as well as political organization and it would uh, and no state would have the right to tell neighboring states what the correct in, uh, uh, interpretation of the Bible was, mm -hmm. uh, but um, the the problem with American hegemony has been that um, it, not only has it been um, influencing the development of nation states since the end of the empires, but it, it's also um, been uh, uh, um, exerting cultural influence in other ways. And uh, so now we have th this terrible problem uh, between, well, with Iran, for example, in the, in the Middle East. And last uh, Friday, when we were un unable to meet, I spent the day in Washington okay. at a board meeting of, um, uh, of an organization that was a consortium of American universities. And I was representing the uh, University of Pennsylvania um, working out um, uh, how to how to solve some of the problems, current problems of the American Institute of Iranian Studies. Mm. 
um, which is an organization that began in uh, the late 60s that I've been involved in ever since. And um, of course, um, uh, since the Iranian revolution has not been able to function in the way that it was functioning before. And this has meant that um, whereas we had a way of training Iranists, people specializing in Iranian studies, which is quite a, a well-developed historical field of academic study. Uh, but since then, since the uh, late 70s, we've had we've not been able to train anybody in this field mm -hmm. and now all the people who were trained in that field and were heading programs in half a dozen universities in america apart from other universities in europe they're all retiring um, are, are retiring and there's nobody to replace them mm -hmm. so this means that whereas um up until 50 years ago uh we knew a lot about the world if you that is in the universities although people in the state department uh, tended not to know very much about the rest of the world uh now in the age of globalization because of what we've been doing um in other ways we're not training scholars uh uh and scientists with uh, experience in in the world as a whole right. Let, let, let me let me let me jump in a little bit. You you you've, you've thrown a lot at me from that one elevator ride, uh, and to, thankfully you you indicated that you had developed a close friendship with this person, and it was not all in one elevator ride. Um, I I fully understand the 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 fact that uh, uh, Neanderthals who descended from the trees and were able to make it out to the plains, especially those who could hold their young under one arm uh, to get out to the watering hole and thus were forced to stand up uh, straighter uh, because they were carrying their young and then do that and get back into the safety of the woods and then come back the next day with another mother with another young uh, uh, child and then groups of them eventually in order to just protect themselves in the event of predators so more would be able to return to the safety of the trees and going on to where we are today i mean this is a blink of an eye in history right <laughs> this is what 30 or 40 or 50,000 years or so. Um, uh -huh. So where this is going to go, I, I think where that group of Neanderthal mothers with their babies at a watering hole out in the middle of a, of a plain in South Central Africa, five or six of them, 50,000 years ago to where we are now with 22 million people living in Mexico City or a billion and a half people connected on Facebook, to have happened in 50,000 years is pretty remarkable. Um, and then I, I superimposed that, that fact on the President of the United States making the speech on Wednesday in front of the United Nations in which he said globalization is dead. It's, it's no longer operable. It's been replaced by national patriotism. And I just don't get it. I don't understand it. Is, is it a is it a complete? I mean, the the speech had to have been written. It, it clearly was not written by the president. The way he delivered it was clear he had not read it before. Uh, it, it's it's official policy of the United States government. I mean, how is it that people are not understanding what's happening, where even the most ill-informed president of this country can can stand there and and make that kind of remark? I, I don't understand where the disconnect is. What do well, you there's, think? There's, there's so much competition between uh, political units of different um, sizes. So uh, the, the large ones compete with each other globally. And now there's competition, obviously, between or de developing competition between America, Europe, European Union and um, China and mm -hmm. and India actually um, and locally but among smaller units so uh, between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan which is the which their relationship's been in the news this past week because they can't agree on their border mm -hmm. which again was drawn by the British mm -hmm. in 1893 
and uh, and Africa is uh, just a patchwork of these problems. Um, so um, I'm afraid, uh, in my mind, of course, I have to be careful what I say so that I don't appear to be doing this, but um, I think that uh, uh, America is um, causing more problems like this than any of the other large countries at the moment, although that may change as uh, the others gradually become more powerful. Uh, because, uh, and, and very, to a large extent, the reason is that the people in charge of policy in this country are, are not academically trained to understand what's going on in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And 50 years ago, uh, I don't think people in America were that well trained either, partly because they are, whereas in Europe, uh, everybody's every country is very close to every other country, and and then the, uh, many of them were had empires which took them in out to all over the world. America didn't have an empire, at least not in that sense, and uh, had uh, two large ponds, one on either side, uh, which separated it from what was going on in other parts of the world. And now we're told that only 30% of Americans, even now in the 21st century, have passports. Right, right, right. So, so it's a, it's really is an anomaly that the the economically most powerful country in the world um, is the center of the of um, uh, the least knowledge about what's going on in the rest of the world. So, in, in a in a funny way, when when we uh, uh, several years ago, would would talk about nations uh, or or states. We would talk about states that were uh, actively trying to thwart the forces of globalization. All right, and we would talk about countries such as North Korea. Um, we would we would talk a little bit about Iran, I think even. Um, where we are now, after several years of discussion. The United States has now entered that category. Mm, yeah, isn't that so? Well, you know, uh, the uh, I mean, it's it's such a um, a paradox, really, that the the Middle East is the bound. Most of the boundaries in the Middle East were drawn by Europeans uh, and then reinforced by Americans. Uh, and American policy since, since the middle of the last century has been to not to export democracy, but to reinforce political stability as Americans understood it, which was um, not democracy because democracy was unpredictable, mm -hmm. uh, partly because it wanted to nationalize local oil companies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which were uh, American owned. Right. Um, and uh, Britain had something to do with this as well. I'm not uh, yeah, Anglo-American oil. Uh, yeah. Well, um, very so, so what, what do you think when, when you get back to your view of the progressive uh, nature of globalization, going back to that blink of an eye to our, our cousins or aunt descendants or ancestors, I should say, coming out of the trees into the plains, uh, where are we going here? Well, I think that, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 what that explains is why coming together has uh, um, been a more important part of the historical process than conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're, um, uh, there's probably more conflict now than there has been, or more, more serious conflict now than there has been in the past. Uh, because of these problems of, of organization. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it's going to change again um, as the um, differences in, in economic and political power between um, America, the European Union, and the other large um, uh, political units, uh, especially China and India, uh, they become more closely related to each other and mm -hmm. have to uh, 
reach some sort of agreement because at the moment there's no effort at all to uh, um, uh, reach agreement on a global level. The, the United Nations was in a way developed for, with that purpose but has been um, not been successful. Well, I think we should probably leave it at there, Professor Schmorner. Um Very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, keep that in mind as I try to interpret the events of this week and the, the week coming up. So, all we'll right. Watch what happens. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.